and welcome to Peace Matters, an IRP and Ponto podcast which deals with contemporary conflicts and how to solve them. Today's episode is about nationalism, radicalization, genocide, a threat for Europe, and I have two very distinguished guests, Julia Ebner and Hikmet Karcic. Julia Ebner is a senior research fellow at the London-based Institute for Strategic Dialogue Her work focuses on right-wing radicalism, on radicalization in general, on terrorism prevention, but also on conspiracy theories. She is also an award-winning author of several books relating to these topics. My other guest today is Hikmet Karacic. He's working at the Sarajevo-based Research Institute for Crimes Against Humanity and International Law. Hikmet has been working extensively on genocide, right-wing extremism and he has also been publishing several articles in Newsweek or in Haaretz or in Foreign Affairs and he has also been the author of several books dealing with these topics. I hope you look forward to the discussion with Julia Ebner dealing with nationalism, radicalization, genocide, a threat to Europe at the podcast Peace Matters. Welcome, Julia and Hikmet. Um, today we are talking about genocide and nationalism and radicalization. And you're coming from dif different fields. I mean, you're researching similar topics, but you're more focusing on the Western Balkans. And you've been dealing a lot on radicalization and nationalism in the European and liberal democracy context. I would actually already start a discussion starting with you, uh, Julia. My question would be, I mean, in your opinion, like, Why is nationalism and radicalization so successful in Europe, especially also in liberal democracies? From your experience, how can you assess the situation these days? It's a really good question. I've been asking myself that question many times over the last few years, especially. I would say that the, the series of crises that we've had in Europe, in, and I mean globally, but Europe has been particularly hard hit by some of them, have really contributed to an acceleration of radicalization um, dynamics and also the rise of populism. So, of course, COVID, the COVID pandemic, but even before that, we had the, the so-called uh, migration and refugee crisis, which already led to a lot of far-right extremist narratives being able to spread. And, and then, yeah, COVID, but now, of course, also the Ukraine war has really polarized our, our democratic countries, especially in Europe, uh, in the countries that are close, closer to the conflict than, say, the US or, or other countries. Um, and now also the, the looming or ongoing economic and living cost crisis. I think that those were really, you could see that there are lots of grievances, frustration with politics um, that could unfortunately be addressed in some ways, or there's a vacuum, a political vacuum that could in some ways be filled by far-right populist parties who always seem to take the exact opposite position and who really almost turn into a counter movement against the status quo and are campaigning for radical change, which is something that has become more appealing in times of crisis because people are scared, there's a lot of fear and there are deep identity crises as well, of course, with the more over, overarching patterns of digitalization, globalization. So I would say that this combination of crisis, but also technological, rapid technological advances have really created quite uh, a toxic atmosphere. Hikmet, uh, when you hear what Julia is saying, I mean, you are coming now directly from Sarajevo. You have been researching on genocide and radicalization in that context. And then we obviously also know about the very, very sad stories, uh, the Balkan Wars in the 90s, which have been Uh, many of them and the atrocities which happened uh, have been ethnically driven there as well. If you hear what Julia is saying, like how would you assess the situation in the Western Balkan context about nationalism, what, what drives nationalism in, in the historical Balkan mm. context uh, until now? Because even until now, we see a lot of national politics, um, people are using nationalism mm. for actually gaining voters or actually, how would you assess the situation in the Western Balkans in this sense? Well, first to say that um, extreme nationalism in, in the Balkans has been around for quite some time, actually, since the start of uh, nation state, the, the, the nation state building processes in, in, in the 19th century. That's when the, the modern nationalism actually uh, grew in the region. And uh, I, I would say that the only time when, when there was no fierce nationalism was during the time of communism, which was from 1945 until 1990. And uh, in, 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 even in this time, when 
the, the, the Yugoslav dictator Josip Broz Tito died, that's when um, former communists decided and knew actually that if they don't play the card of nationalism, they, that they are going to lose the elections, uh, the first democratic mm. elections, so on. So the case in which former uh, communists who were, who were really high-ranking members of the Communist Party overnight became very big, strong nationalist leaders, uh, uh, and so on, like in the case of Franjo Tujman from, from the president of Croatia and, and Slobodan Milosevic, uh, the president of, of, of Yugoslavia at, at that time, they were former high-ranking uh, communist officials who became uh, a national, uh, very, very harsh nationalist leaders and who went that far to commit uh, um, uh, mass atrocities and, and, and even genocide in order to achieve uh, some, of, uh, some of their uh, strategic goals political goals in the region. And unfortunately, this, this uh, sentiment of, of extreme nationalism has become very appealing to the masses. Uh, it's something which we see currently in the region as well. We see that, that uh, many, many uh, nationalist leaders played a card on the, on the 90s, uh, going back into, into you know, 30 years ago, and ignoring the, the, the everyday needs of, of local people in order to, to gain votes. And unfortunately, this is something which is, which is very still, still very appealing. And another aspect is that we have the rise of far-right groups in the region and movements, which are fostered by these governments. So the governments tolerate these groups, which would then, in case of some um, extreme scenario, be some sort of new paramilitary group, which would, which would you know, be out of the control of the state, like it was in the late, uh, in the early 90s uh, with, 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 with the Yugoslav regime. So uh, currently, uh, I would say that my assessment is that currently nationalism, extreme nationalism uh, and radicalization in, in the Balkans is really on a rise, especially in the last, uh, in the last decade. Julia Hikmet said it becomes very appealing to masses and it is on the rise. And I would say the same situation we're also facing in Europe. I mean, we're upcoming, we're having elections next year. If we look at Austria and also Germany, we see that right-wing parties are on an extreme rise as well. Um, how would you say, why is it so easy to, to mainstream quite radical ideas? Also, when you consider, you know, the difficult history we are having with the Holocaust, I mean, in, in the um, Austrian and also German context in general. It's really concerning, to be honest, because both in Germany and in Austria, we have, of course, quite a significant, we've had had investments in the education system to really make sure there is awareness about our histories. And yet, right now, we see the, the Alternative for Germany, but also the FPÖ, use some of the, the vocabulary that is, that is directly taken and, and some of the conspiracy myths that really follow the patterns of, of narratives that we've seen in the past and that we've even seen um, kind of in the Nazi period, like uh, terms with terms like Lügenpresse and this really fundamental hatred against the established press being so present again in the rhetoric of even high profile uh, far right politicians. The same is true uh, in rhetoric against minority communities, whether we talk about the LGBTQ community or about, um, or, or of course about um, Jews and, and also Muslim communities. I think it's really scary to see some of these terms resurface. And often I would say language is one of the first indicators of this mainstreaming process, where you can see that there is a normalization of, of this vocabulary um, again, that is, that is quite concerning. And the, the AFD, of course, the AFD in Germany was founded 10 years ago uh, with more the goal of kind of campaigning against the EU, being in favor of, of a German exit from the EU. But now it's really at the height of both its radicalism and its popularity. So it's very explicit in some of its conspiracy myths and narratives. And at the same time, it's, it's so popular that I found this really quite chilling to, to watch um, the, yeah, the polls in Germany and the same is of course true for Austria with FPÖ now topping the polls um, despite a series of, of scandals but also um, as I said very explicit contacts also with, with far-right groups in a similar manner they've also of course played into the hands of um, far-right extremist groups mm -hmm. in Austria like the Generation Identity and New Right movements um, that have really been legitimized and, and very much uh, normalized in their 
for example, a great replacement yeah. ideology, this idea that white native populations are being erased or are being replaced gradually with migrant communities, which has, of course, also inspired terrorist attacks across the globe, the Christchurch attack in New mm. Zealand a few years ago and a series of other attacks. So I think seeing that the mainstreaming of that and how successful that is currently with voters where um, people within the FPÖ have even mentioned this uh, term of the great replacement, that is really something very concerning, I find. Yula has been saying this mainstreaming of radical ideas is on the rise again, even though, especially in the German context, I mean, we did have, you know, this um, um, we were forced, let's say, about dealing with the past, dealing with history. From your context, how would you assess the situation there, you know, because uh, when we talk about Western Balkans, what happened in the 90s, there didn't really happen reconciliation. What did happen, of course, there was the establishment of the ICTY, I mean, the special court, and uh, some facts and some truth uh, were actually established. But how would you see the situation now, like how is dealt with history mm. in this context and how important is memory of atrocities and how are politicians dealing with it, but maybe also the education system? Uh, well, you're right. I mean, in, in, in the Balkans, we didn't have any sort of concrete dealing with the past process or there were many initiatives for reconciliation and so on and so forth, but this was mainly fostered by uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, I always like to say that in the case of Bosnia, the war never ended. It's uh, it's a frozen conflict, actually, because you have, uh, just like in the 90s, several um, neighboring countries and, and, and maybe superpowers who are actually right now uh, mingling in, in, inside inside the, the works of, uh, and, and, the, and the internal politics of a very small nation, which, uh, just like Kosovo, can very quickly, the fire can very quickly spread acro across the region. Um, and you're right, we, unlike Germany, the educational system in the Balkans is divided, so there's no, everybody learns a different history textbook. Uh, everybody learns alternative versions of history. Um, if in the same country, if you, in Bosnia, if you go in, in one city, you learn that, learn that, uh, Srebrenica was overtaken and the city of, the town of Srebrenica in Eastern Bosnia, uh, that the genocide was committed in July 1995. If you go, 20 kilometers east, you will learn that Srebrenica was liberated in 1995. So these are two different uh, versions which are uh, intentionally being promoted by, 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 um, by certain aspects and certain governments in the region. Um, so so when, when you look at it from, from, from these facts, you could say that it's a very grim situation. But however, um, when I saw in what position Northern Ireland was, for example, that's when I figured that Bosnia isn't such a bad case because you know there are there are uh, areas which are which are definitely you know in, in a much much bad situation. But uh, all in all, the ICTY did a very great job. But also the the local courts in Bosnia, they did a great job in 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 showing and for the first time uh, in, in in the history of um, the Balkans, we have an international tribunal which uh, questioned and, and, and uh, addressed the, the mass atrocities which were committed throughout the region. So this was something new, this is something for the first time, and I would say that even though maybe some, some results would, would show a different uh, opinion poll and so on, if you talk to ordinary people, they, they realize and they know what happened and so on, they won't maybe recognize it as a genocide. But they know that uh, individually they would say that mass atrocities were, were committed. The problem was in the last uh, 10 years is that, um, even 10, 15 years, is that people who in 2000, for example, would, would have recognized mass atrocities, today, out of populism, deny it. So today it has become cool to deny court-established facts. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the, the populism we, we, we talked about earlier, and this is something which is appealing to, to, to the media, to the masses, and so on. And of course, this is something which is instru instrumentalized and, um, and fostered by the government. So, you know, if you have coordinated media publishing certain uh, facts about Kosovo, about Bosnia, and so on, then you can see that there's a pattern of these organized media outlets which are state-run and state-controlled, which intentionally uh, promote this kind of narrative. 
with with the far right groups in in Europe, it's often you often see that the denial of historical facts goes hand in hand with the yeah. denial of current current um, current state affairs, which is interesting. With of course COVID denial or also disinformation about the Ukraine war, then often going hand in hand with conspiracy myths, even about the Second World War, for mm -hmm. example. Do you see the same thing in 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 the in the former kind of in Yugoslavian context in that in the Balkans region that there is a denial of both historical facts about uh, genocide and mass atrocities but also about ongoing crises like COVID or oh definitely definitely yes yeah, so um, people who denied um, Srebrenica or, or some other crimes denied the existence of COVID you know they, they mm -hmm. thought it was some Vatican conspiracy or you know something like that so so you had a lot of these cases. And of course, because um, you could see that a lot of um, certain media outlets or, or, or social media, which was controlled by uh, Russian-backed, uh, uh, Russian-sponsored channels, were fostering this kind of conspiracy theories. You know that uh, th this was this was that you know COVID doesn't exist. That the, this is all a pharmaceutical um, you know conspiracy to earn money and so on. Yeah. And, and then a, a later post would be about um, Bosnian Muslims wanting to. Um, uh, have a demographic replacement of, of people in the region. So this mm -hmm. great replacement narrative is something which was very active uh, in the 90s and which has today come back again. So, so you have a, a lot of similarities. And this is something which isn't, let's say, um, um, new too much because um, uh, far-right groups and far-right individuals cooperate with each other. Yeah. So you had Steve Bannon coming to to, to Serbia, uh, to, you know, at the height of of of, of Trump's uh, presidency, coming to Serbia to meet up with with Vucic, and then you have Orban, Dodik, uh, Milorad Dodik, the the the, the president of Republika Srpska, the the Bosnian Serb entity. He went and visited Orban yesterday. So mm -hmm. there are so many uh, connections which you which you have on on high state level, but you also have these localized movements which which. Uh, which cooperate and which actually learn from each other and they have some sort of their own network. And also international or pan-European cooperation. It was very interesting. I was at a, undercover at a radical pro-Putin protest in Frankfurt last year or two years ago. Last year, it was last year. And I met, there was a Serbian nationalist, very far right in his, his ideas. Um, and also very conspiratorial in his thinking, who was also was also a COVID denier and who was also very much spreading disinformation about the Ukraine war. So it was interesting how all these factors became or came together. Mm -hmm. But he was extremely well networked in the German sphere of yeah. far right extremists and also the the conspiracy theory movements. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Julia, since uh, you were also talking about, you know, denying facts and uh, I just read your recent book also on mass radicalization and um, you're also um, doing your research, you know, by going to specific events and you, um, and um, my question would be in this context, you also went to these, um, to an event, I think it was against um, a climate change, you know, mm -hmm. and there you have like many, many people who are denying all these facts, you know, like why is science not appalling anymore? And I even remember that in your book then then you came to a table where there were then right-wing people so you know that actually people who are denying science who are talking more about there is no climate change but then find each other again like with other extreme narratives or ideologies i mean how would you assess this in in, in your experience there seems to be a very big overlap between different communities and movements that are against, that are opposed to the establishment, as, as they would mm -hmm. call it. And that can be established science, established media institutions, political institutions, even demo democratic institutions. So there's this underlying deep fundamental distrust that builds up. And if it builds up in one area, if they start to deny um, science as such, it's much easier to then add on additional conspiracy myths about the media covering up supposedly or about um, the politicians being corrupt and playing along. And that is something where also psychologists have found a pattern where actually the biggest predictor for people to believe in one conspiracy is that they already believe in, in another conspiracy theory. So once you open that Pandora's box, you really you can really easily get from one conspiracy myth into the next one. 
which is of course hu hugely relevant in times of COVID denial, in times of yeah, so much disinformation about the Ukraine war, and even conspiracy myths that are not really can not really be seen as harmful or dangerous, they can open up that door to then more more toxic conspiracy myths. For example, the flat earth movement is really mm -hmm. small and is very, I mean, it's just, it's absurd. <laughs> um, and it's simply just, again, opposed to science. But it can often serve as a starting point for then denying everything else as well and questioning questioning everything from mm -hmm. scientific institutions to, yeah, to, to, to even democratic institutions. Um, of course, we've now also seen both in the US, but it's also leaking into Europe slowly, election denial mm -hmm. or election fraud narratives which I would say are also a very dangerous phenomenon because they put a question mark um, to all the democratic processes and institutions that, that are fundamental pillars of our functioning democratic systems. And I would say that that's also a big threat for the future. But definitely when I went to that climate change denial conference or climate change skepticist conference, as they would call it, um, there were also there were people from different backgrounds. You did have pseudo-scientists who just wanted to go against mainstream science, who wanted to go and be contrarians. Uh, and then you also had quite a few local or former AfD politicians, former far right populist politicians, people who didn't believe in the media anymore, um, but also just activists. And part of those, those activist movements, uh, the people that I sat down next to at the dinner table, they were from the Generation Identity, mm. or at least from the, from the New Right movement. And I was literally sitting next to someone who spread, who told me about great replacement mm -hmm. ideas and who shared very racist um, narratives and was clearly radicalized into the, the far right white nationalist spectrum. So you could see that they were kind of coalescing around the same around the same events, whether that's about denying climate change or whether that's about great replacement narratives. There is a sense that these different movements um, that fundamentally distrust everything are coming together. Yeah, they believe that that the official truth exists and that the state controls information and truth and so on, and that exactly yeah. uh, we live in a post-truth uh, era, and that you know if you want to learn the truth, you need to explore yourselves. And one of the things which I found interesting was that certain um, ideas which were promoted by the leftists 20, 30 years ago uh, today have become uh, very appealing to the far right. For example. Uh, I saw a couple of far-right um, uh, groups on, on, on Instagram sharing um, an interview with um, Gaddafi from you know, 2004 or five, who's talking about um, conspiracy theory about 9-11, for example, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, about you know, the West wanting to control oil in the Middle East and so on. And you can see that there's a s switch from, from the anti-imperialism uh, narrative, which was 20 years ago, where now you have the far-right showing that you know, these Leaders such as Gaddafi were right, you know, 20 years ago. So now we have yeah. to question everything which is coming out there. Yeah. Yulia has been explaining also before, you know, that masses are becoming a little bit more radicalized. It's easier. It's becoming a little bit more mainstream. Um, if we then put it together, you know, with what happened in the Western Balkans when it then comes to genocide, because this is something very difficult to understand, to understand for me, you know, that people who used to live together can become so radicalized that at one point they actually go along and kill each other. I mean, you have been researching this mm -hmm. issue. Can you give us um, just like some, uh, some kind of explanation how this is actually possible? Like how this kind of um, situation can lead to this total... Uh, there is no more extreme yeah. form of um, yeah. an atrocity than a genocide in general or a crime against humanity. But how can this actually function of people who used to live together? I think it's very difficult to understand in, in a context from a liberal democra democratic country, which Austria, at least for now, still is. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's a question for, for uh, each genocide. I mean, in every genocide, you have, you have cases where people who knew each other, you know, would, would, would come and, you know, you out of, of your apartment and you know or kill you or take you to a, take you to a concentration camp you had these cases in, in, in during the Holocaust on, on a massive massive scale uh, what was interesting in, in, in Bosnia in the 90s was that um, a, a majority of the perpetrators who committed the crimes knew knew their victims very well because these were very 
small um, cohesent communities, 12,000 people living in a small mm -hmm. town. Um, you, you, know, you knew what your neighbor had for breakfast, so it's, it was very, very, very compact. Uh, how, do, how does it how does it come to from 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 this uh, you know, living together to, to to mass atrocities and and, and perpetrator bystander victim situation? Um, in my research, I saw that there were several uh, segments. Firstly, historical revisionism. So in the light, late 1980s. Uh, you had people who started talking about um, the World War II genocide of Serbs in, in the Ustasha um, regime, which was the, the Nazi puppet regime in, in, in Croatia. And so uh, there was this narrative that the communists did not allow for, for um, these, the truth about Jasnovac, about um, the, the major camp and about the suffering of the Serbs to come out. So this is finally we have the time after 50 years to, to talk about our suffering. And uh, the main perpetrators there were, were seen as the, uh, the Croats, the Dustasha, but also the Bosniak Muslims who were considered to be like um, um, the, the additional perpetrators of, of, of the Ustasha crimes. And that's one thing. Another thing is uh, anti-Muslim sentiment. They usually use the term Islamophobia, which I don't, I don't use in the context of Bosnia. I call it anti-Muslim hatred or, or anti-Muslim bigotry. Yeah, this, uh, you know, like the, the issue, you know, there are too many Muslims living in the country. We need to, if we don't get rid of them, they're going to take over this country in 20, 30 years' time. Um, that was a, demographics was a huge aspect and uh, very under, under, underrated among uh, scholars. And thirdly, you had opportunism, which was v very, very uh, uh, widespread. Now, how do you explain such brutalities of a crime. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote the whole book about about brutalities in a camp. Honestly, there's no concrete answer right now. This is something which which you would have to, you know, do psychological tests with people and so on. But uh, this amount of of brutalities which were which were committed that, that's the most hideous um, uh, elements of the crimes because the numbers of people killed, if you look statistically, weren't that big. I mean, uh, the, of course there were. Uh, numbers are, are, are huge and so on, but um, the number of people killed in, in, in the camps in Bosnia were much less than in, 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 in other cases, in other genocides and so on. But the brutality levels were high. And especially if a perpetrator is somebody who you know, then the aspects of reconciliation are very slim. So uh, that, that's something which has been, let's say, uh, um, un, un, um, hasn't been part of, of, of the focus of many, of many people who were dealing with, with the questions of reconciliation and so on. But I would say that these three main aspects were, were, were crucial uh, in the mobilization of these masses. You know, they would say, uh, if we don't do this right now, they're going to have a repetition of the genocide from World War mm -hmm. II. Think the Croats and the Muslims are gonna reopen camps for us. So we have to get rid of them and so on and so forth. Plus this demographic aspect um, you have a case in which uh, the Serb Democratic Party, which was which was led by by uh, the Serb nationalist uh, leader and later on genocide convict um, uh, Radovan Karadzic, he, uh, he they commissioned a group of experts to to predict um, statistically how many Muslims are going to live in Bosnia in 2021, mm. in 1991. So demographics was a huge aspect for them, and this whole great replacement narrative was very much present in, in Bosnia at the time. Uh, but how, how does one become so brutal? Uh, that's something which, which I couldn't find an answer to. I did for my, for my PhD in Oxford, I did a terrorist manifesto analysis, of course, of non-state terrorists who've committed big, kind of the big attacks of the last 10 years. So I analyzed, systematically analyzed those terrorist manifestos and the language and psychological factors. Um, that were that showed up as statistically significant patterns, and I was wondering if you do you think it might be similar for for potentially also what happens in genocides because the the patterns that showed up as statistically most significant are um, there's a phenomenon called identity fusion mm -hmm. when your personal identity becomes one with the group identity. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, there's this external threat perspective that the in-group is completely threatened. Mm -hmm. And there have been previous studies that also linked that identity fusion plus threat um, 
to to a much higher willingness to commit pro-group extreme forms of pro-group violence, mm -hmm. and that was really that showed up as very significant in these in these terrorist mindsets. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, and of course that often also was combined with a dehumanization of of the enemy of the perceived um, the group that was perceived as threatening that perceived out group and demonizing and, and dehumanizing narratives and kind of an overall violence endorsing violence condoning um, norm in the in the group do you think that these factors might also be relevant for for the commitment of of mass atrocities like genocides i'm, I'm pretty it's, sure definitely i mean what you're just saying right now i would i would definitely put in the context of, of bosnia and rwanda uh yeah. in both cases because you, you, you had um, a lot of examples of 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 these um, um, how do you call it the identity fusion. identity fusion, that's, yeah, yeah that's and of one. course also the threat with as you say the great replacement ideology, which also played a role in a lot of these terrorist attacks that we've exactly. seen, where there is a this this idea that there is this existential threat to the survival of the in group or to mm -hmm. the um, to the existence of the in group. Uh, which maybe also brings me then to one of the last questions, because it's about the instrumentalization also of genocide. You know, when you talk about this uh, uh, great uh, replacement, you know, it gives uh, people the feeling or the narrative is created that there is something going on, like a genocide against white people, which obviously is contrafactional. But, you know, mm -hmm. like how important is also this um, instrumentalization of genocide? You know, we hear it a lot also that genocide can also be very constituent for people, especially mm -hmm. in the case of um, today. Uh, Israel Jews, it's very the history is very very important for them mm -hmm. to portray themselves as Israeli Jews. Or if you talk to Armenians, yeah, you cannot really mm -hmm. talk to Armenians now in a political sphere without actually referring at one point to yeah. the genocide. And on the other hand, you have like this feeling of um, injustice, which plays along, you know, um, for those people who are might may be feeling that they are losing something. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you maybe, as one of the last questions, um, would deal with this question about um, instrumentalization of genocide? And is it a problem or should we be aware or careful while using the term? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, in the, definitely in the context of, of some countries, of course, words such as genocide or terrorism have also been exploited for political purposes. Even what you said earlier about that historical revisionism that happened at the time, mm. um, narratives of a victimization of the in-group, I think that that can of course often then also lead to strong hatred towards the out-group and that can be projected on, on, on the present. I think it's, yeah, I think it's usually important. That's why it's, I think it's usually important to have those reconciliation efforts and, and actual efforts of bringing in dialogue between communities where it maybe in the past there have been atrocities against each other. Yeah. Um, and even in, I mean, even to some extent, of course, hostilities that are very much rooted in history between countries um, against each other, like the German-French rivalry and the German-French, this, this deep um, hostility after um, kind of the settlement of the, the first World War after the Versailles Treaty, where there was a very deep frustration in the German mindset um, towards the French, but also in general, there was this very strong victimization narrative. I think those can be very, very toxic, and I definitely think that's, that they can be politically instrumentalized. Um, so I would say that reconciliation efforts and, and dialogue, um, and, and also for international relations, really, there is a very big role in the prevention of future mass atrocities. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, genocide plays a very, as you mentioned, a, a very, a very important role in the identity building of of, of certain nations, like Israel, Armenia, uh, the case of Bosnia as well. Um, Bosniaks have become much more, let's say, nationally conscious due to the genocide. Um, of course, in certain cases, you have, a, let's say, an, an overkill of the use of the term. Uh, Sometimes, you know, and by using it too much, too often, you, you, you in, in my personal opinion, you degrade the term to some aspect. Mm. To some aspect. Um, I'm very often very, very critical of, of my fellow uh, countrymen and, and, uh, and colleagues and so on who very often talk about it and uh, um, use, the term, use the term for as an explanation for any, any problem a country has today, you know. Okay. 
like if you say that uh, you know the 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 roads in Bosnia aren't good, then you're gonna then somebody's gonna say you know well there was a genocide 30 years ago, so the ro roads aren't good today. That's of course not the case. Corruption is the case today. Um, for those of us who deal with 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 the, with the issue of genocide, we know very well who committed it, when it committed it, and so on. Um, on the other hand, what I would like here to mention is that certain groups, like the far right groups, use the term genocide um, not only in the case of the grave replacement theory, but also like if you remember when there was uh, when people had to be vaccinated for COVID, yeah. then they would say, you know, the government is committing a sure. genocide against us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, this is some, which this is using the term uh, in this way. They're also downgrading uh, the, the term, which which has a very serious context, you know. Or they were, they were even using the term Holocaust for, for, for uh, you know, they're trying to commit the Holocaust against us for, for, for uh, the COVID vaccines and so on. So In this Germany, term, that's even considered a crime because it's relativizing the actual Holocaust to equate the vaccinations or, yeah, what's hap what, what happened during I COVID. I remember in the U.S. there was, there was I think, um, on, on one of those TV shows, they were, they were, they were, they were using the, the term the Holocaust and, and the genocide for, for the COVID vaccines. And that, that was really causing outrage among, among people, among survivors, among family members and so on. So, um, yes, I would, I would say that to some extent uh, the, the term is being used too oftenly for, for even events which don't constitute a genocide. Um, but there are examples, I always mention the, the example of Rwanda, which did a very, very good job in, 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 um, in, in the reconciliation effort, but also in the commemoration efforts. Uh, now it's it's a question of how how much to commemorate and how little to commemorate and if commemorations in in and the, the issue of collective memory does it bring together reconciliation or does it bring uh, society more into polarization mm. that's a question in Rwanda you have 100 days in which you can um, mourn the dead mm. the victims other other uh, the rest of the time it's 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 forbidden to uh, to commemorate the genocide, the mm -hmm. Rwanda genocide. But of course, the, the context in, in Rwanda is different because the perpetrators were militarily defeated, yeah. just like in the Holocaust. Uh, in the case of Bosnia, the perpetrators were not militarily defeated. Today we have, a, and often when I talk to, 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 to some German colleagues, I tell them, imagine if you had a small uh, Bavarian, uh, you know, a small state in Bavaria which had uh, Nazi laws, the Denmark laws there, and so on and so forth. Imagine that still existing, and that's what you have today. You know, the the police of the the Bosnian Serb police, which took part in the in the, the genocide, most of the people who took part in it uh, work as traffic officers or, or high-ranking commanders and so on. So it's something which is a difficult thing to 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 deal with uh, when we talk about. Uh, to what extent yeah. do we overuse the term genocide? Even I some, sometimes uh, uh, question myself, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. I mention it too much? You know? Yeah, I think it's a very important topic and we should have maybe a podcast alone about this topic mm -hmm. at one point. Very unfortunately, we're already coming to an end, but I do have uh, one last question since the podcast is called Peace Matters. And what does peace actually mean in this context? And if you just have in one minute, what could we do in order to foster peace, which is obviously not nationalism, not radicalization, not genocide. Mm -hmm. Very, very briefly. Maybe you start, and then the last. I would say that education is the most important. Thing. That's what I saw. That's what I saw in my work so far. Educating people about uh, all aspects and, and about the, the the green, the the red flags, the the early warning systems, the the, the historical facts. Uh, only in in this way uh, can we counter mm -hmm. historical revisionism and denial. Peace matters. I would, I would definitely agree with, with the importance of education. I think the broader term resilience, societal resilience is really important here. That's something where I think we've seen a, a decreased resilience level, unfortunately, um, at least from, I can speak about Europe, but in recent years, um, where the, the, these crises have really shaken up uh, the, the, the fundamental tissue that, that tied together our societies or that held them together. And I think um, helping to build that resilience also means keeping up with, with tech 
trends. With, mm-hmm. We've always seen that in times of technological revolution, these new technologies have led to a lot of societal change and could also bring about new conspiracy myths, new mm-hmm. um, hatred against minorities, new forms of competition that then led to hostilities. And I think it's important to, to um, really educate people on how they can brace themselves from being exploited, for example, now in in online spaces or how to also on a, on a psychological level to work on that intersection between psychology. What do these new um, technologies also mean for us as as individuals, as groups, as societies and and digital literacy? Mm-hmm. So I would say there's not enough happening yet, both in the in the school uh, kind of education system, but also outside of schools for the digital migrants, as we can mm-hmm. call them, not just the digital natives. Thank you so much, um, Julia and Hikmet. It was super interesting for me. I think there's so many topics we still need to discuss. And it is very important that at one point we come to this resilient and educated societies uh, in all over Europe and probably also even around the globe since these uh, things are not halting at borders. Let me thank you again. And uh, for all our listeners, uh, this was our Peace Matters podcast. Uh, you can listen to it on uh, Apple Podcast and Spotify, and it's also on YouTube as a video podcast. Stay tuned for more episodes. Thanks again. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.